So I'm going to talk about energy trends in a very broad sense. I'm going to talk about those at a global level, at a national level, and a state level. I'm going to talk about problems with fossil fuels, and I'm guessing that this audience is probably really familiar with those, so I'm going to go through that really fast. Um, I'm going to talk about sales trends, electric vehicles, solar, and wind, and what's happening in those industries, and then I'm going to focus on Michigan, and what's happening with renewable energy here in Michigan. I'm going to talk about the utilities reaction to the success of renewables, which has been striking. Uh, and policy changes is actually, um, I can only think of one other time in the last 25 years when there's been as much happening in energy policy as there is right now. Uh, so from that perspective, we live in exciting times. Um, you'll learn about Michigan's energy economy, and we really fit into national trends. As I looked at the statistics on Michigan, um, Michigan isn't like remarkably different than the rest of the country. We have a couple areas where we're a little different, but we're, we're really following the trends, maybe trailing a little bit. Um, burning fossil fuels creates numerous problems, and if we're going to avert uh, climate change, we're going to have to make drastic cuts in our CO2 emissions. Um, wind and solar are still small. They used to be um, negligible. They were so small they just didn't matter on any kind of chart. That's no longer true. Uh, and they're growing very quickly still. Um, rooftop photovoltaic installations are now perceived as a serious threat to the utility companies, and they are striking back. Um, and Michigan energy policies are undergoing some dramatic changes right now. I'm going to talk about those. So we talk about fossil fuels, and I just like to set the, the historical tone here. Fossil fuels are relatively new. Until the Industrial Revolution, all of our energy was renewables. Remember we used to talk about alternative energy? It was the alternative to fossil fuels and nuclear, right? So before the Industrial Revolution, there was no alternative energy. This was the energy, right? If you wanted to get uh, warm, uh, you lit a fire, and that was usually wood. It might be peat, it might be done, but you burn something, and it was a biofuel. And if you wanted to get some work done, you know, hooked up some horses, right? Muscle power was the dominant way that uh, things got done. Uh, you, you might move things with sails, and if you wanted to do some real industrial sort of activity like grinding grain, you used the power of the wind or the power of water. It was all renewable. There, there wasn't, these weren't alternatives to anything. They were the way things were. If you look at uh, energy consumption in the world uh, with the start of the Industrial Revolution, um, you can see originally here we've got biofuels, right? It was all biofuels, and then we started adding coal, and then we started adding uh, oil and natural gas and hydroelectric power and nuclear, and you've got this exponential growth curve of our consumption of energy, so that um, in the period from 1820 to 2000, we uh, increased our consumption of energy 25-fold. And so we have in our society now at our disposal energy slaves, machines that do all kinds of wonderful work for us because we have these vast amounts of energy available. That curve is just a little misleading because uh, population was growing exponentially during that period as well. In this curve, we're looking at world energy consumption per person. Right? And you see there, there's still that sort of you know, exponential curve there, and you can see the, the different fuels uh, coming online. Um, but it's about a factor of four increase in per person energy consumption since the Industrial Revolution. And I look at that, that sounds a little low to me, because we live in the wealthy West. Right? So if you look at the energy consumption of a subsistence farmer in uh, you know, India or Bangladesh, or, well, their energy consumption really hasn't changed. Right? So ours has been able to go up a whole lot more than four times. <clears throat> Moving from the global numbers to the national numbers here, this is the history of energy consumption in the United States um, from the Industrial Revolution. Uh, again, you can see that you've, you've got your biofuels there that kind of reached a, a peak and then declined, and coal came online. And in early 1900s, coal was king, right? The dominant industries of the nation were coal and steel and railroads. And that was all about coal. Coal made the steel, coal fueled the railroads. 
And so it was coal that took us from an agricultural um, uh, economy to an industrial economy. Um, oil came online, and of course Henry Ford, right here in Michigan, you know, made the assembly lines that made automobiles affordable, and our consumption of oil skyrocketed. Um, and, and is still the, the dominant uh, source of energy. Later on, we developed a lot of uh, hydroelectric dams. Uh, nuclear power uh, came on uh, late to the show here. And down here you see wind energy, right? So it, it shows on the graph, uh, but it's a nice steep curve. It's, it's growing quickly. It's a little bit dangerous to always look at aggregates, right? An average can hide a lot of information. So, you know, not everyone in the world is consuming the same amount of energy, and in fact, there are dramatic differences. So this is per capita energy consumption in the United States. You see it hasn't varied all that much um, in this time frame. Um, so energy used in the former Soviet Union, you know, fell as the Soviet Union fell apart. Uh, European consumption. But my point here is that in the United States, we're consuming about twice as much energy as the average European, and about four times as much energy as the average citizen of the world, uh, or of China, which is right about at the world average now. This is a view here in the U.S. of uh, where we get our energy, and you see that petroleum is still king, and it's second cousin natural gas. Natural gas is often discovered with uh, petroleum. Um, coal is, is smaller, but still important. The nuclear power is still a chunk there. Renewable energy, 10%, sounds pretty good. Um, but a lot of that is still hydro, which isn't really expanding much in this country. We've developed the uh, good hydroelectric situations. Wood, we're still burning to deal with. Biofuels here has grown, and that really represents ethanol and biodiesel. And we've got a sizable ethanol industry here in Michigan. Um, wind is now you know, kind of on the map, and the solar is still very small. Okay, this is a very busy chart, <laughs> but I love it. Um, so this is US energy use, and then I'm going to show you the same chart for Michigan. Okay? On the left side here, we've got sources of energy. These are called primary energy sources. Petroleum, biomass, coal, natural gas, geothermal, wind, hydro, nuclear, solar. On the right side, we've got sectors of the economy that consume this energy. Transportation, industrial, commercial, it's typically office buildings, uh, shops and things, and residential, our homes. And in between there, we've got electricity generation. So electricity generation is just an energy conversion, right? It consumes primary energy sources and produces electricity that's then used in these other sectors. Um, all of the solar, practically all the solar energy, uh, all the nuclear energy, nearly all the hydro, nearly all the wind, uh, all go into electricity production. Um, a chunk of natural gas, the vast majority of the coal, and a little smidgen of petroleum and biomass go into electricity production. Electricity production consumes about 40% of our primary energy, and we can do so many wonderful things with electricity. That conversion process is not terribly efficient. Uh, about a third of the energy is, becomes useful electricity, and about two-thirds becomes rejected heat. Power plants mm -hmm. throw off enormous amounts of waste heat and require cooling this is obviously a big problem with nuclear power plants, right? If they shut down, you have to keep cooling them or they melt, uh, as we discovered in Fukushima. Um, natural gas, our most uh, flexible fuel, a chunk of it goes into electricity generation, some goes in and heats homes, some heats buildings, uh, some feeds industrial processes. Uh, if you're melting metals or, or making glass, or just heating the factory, right? All kinds of uses for natural gas in the industrial zone. Little sliver of natural gas goes into transportation, right? We have natural gas fueled uh, vehicles, um, pipelines, which are considered transportation, uh, and they actually be powered with natural gas flowing through them. And then uh, biomass, uh, largely into <coughs> industrial processes, um, and petroleum, predominantly into transportation, and a chunk into uh, industrial processes. Mainly the making of plastics and lubricants. Yes. So 
So this is only the natural gas that goes into energy, not the natural gas that's used as a chemical feedstock? I believe, if we look at natural gas here, we see, well actually yeah, it would be uh, industrial. So no, the feedstock aspect of it would be included in that industrial um, piece, I believe. Um, and yeah, it's particularly used in the production of fertilizers and also uh, synthetic fabrics and uh, into plastics as well. Um, natural gas is also used to uh, create hydrogen, and hydrogen is used in the petroleum refining industry uh, to thermally crack very heavy oil into lighter oils like gasoline. Um, and it's also used in food production. So if you see on a food label hydrogenated vegetable oils, that means they added hydrogen in a chemical process, and almost all of our hydrogen is produced from natural gas. This is the same diagram only for Michigan instead of the country. Um, you see the same sort of thing, solar, nuclear, hydro, wind, uh, feeding in electricity generation, some natural gas. Um, the big differences between the country and Michigan, uh, the nuclear uh, line looks a little bigger here. We are more reliant on nuclear in Michigan than the country as a whole. Uh, a little less natural gas flowing into uh, electricity generation, uh, more coal. So our, our electricity industry is much more nuclear and coal based than the country at large. Um, and we feed more natural gas uh, into these sectors um, because we have a cold climate and we need a lot more heat. So not really an aspect of some decision we made, it's just where we live, it's cold. At a really high level, I like the simplicity of this. What we really do with energy is we heat things, we move things, we produce electricity. And it's 30, 30, 40 is a rough, you know, gauge there, right? And you just kind of classify anything there. Within the heating things, it, you know, kind of two big differences. We've just got space heating, right? Providing low temperature, a nice ambient environment for us. Or we've got industrial processes using very high temperature heats, whether you're you know, smelting steel or manufacturing glass. Focusing on the electricity production aspect of it, because that's where renewables really uh, are playing the role, uh, at least so far. Um, this is electricity generation in the United States. Uh, Number one is natural gas. Coal has now been displaced into number two position uh, in the uh, country, and nuclear is number three. Uh, you've got a chunk of hydro there, oh, wind, five and a half percent, um, not too shabby, uh, biomass and, and other. In Michigan, the pie chart almost looks the same, but the, the quantities are swapped around. Uh, so at the top we've got coal, and number two is nuclear, and natural gas is number three, wind at 4.2%. So a little less than the national average, but still seen as a good player. So fossil energy in Michigan. Um, so Michigan is a large state from a population perspective, right? You always see this in the elections. We've got you know, a good number of uh, electoral college uh, members. We're the 10th largest population in the state. We've got 3% of the uh, country's population, 2.6% of its gross domestic product. And so I put that in there because when you look at how much of uh, different things we're doing, you would expect it to be sort of in line with our population, right? Um, Coal, coal production is zero. We, we have no operating coal mines in Michigan anymore. We did back in the 1950s, they closed out. Uh, but we're a large consumer, ninth in the country of coal, uh, a little disproportionately high compared to our population. Uh, we have very little oil, and we produce very little oil. Uh, we consume uh, a good bit of oil. Uh, we have some natural gas reserves here. We have some production. We're now 18th in the country and our natural gas production is uh, in decline. Um, we consume uh, a lot of gas. We're, we're in the top 10 there, again, because of our cold climate. Um, we produce electricity kind of in line with our population. Our CO2 emissions are right in line with our electricity production. Um, but we are number one in the country in the storage of natural gas. The storage, not, not the production, but the storage. And that's a uh, geological view. We have underground caverns that are tightly sealed, they'll hold gas. And so all through the summer, we bring in gas from around the country, 
particularly the um, Gulf of Mexico. And it's pumped into these underground uh, storage units, a uh, big cluster of them here up by Port Huron, but also around the state, to store that gas. And then it's drawn out of storage during the winter when there's uh, high demand. So in that perspective, uh, Michigan is, is fairly unique uh, among the states. Um, and there's a, a nice benefit to that for all of us, which is uh, here in Michigan, we pay about 30% less for our natural gas than the average in the country, even though it's not much of it is produced here, right? We're, we're bringing it in from around the country, but our prices are still lower because we have so much uh, storage facilities here. And in fact, uh, during the winter, Michigan is exporting natural gas out of that storage into the surrounding states. Fossil fuel has many problems, and uh, I'm sure most of you are very familiar with them, but I'm gonna run over these. Uh, I'm gonna start with the cost of oil. Um, oil's a lot more expensive than just what we're paying for it at the pump. The United States is still importing 25% of our oil. We've all heard about fracking. U.S. oil production uh, has gone up 40, 45% uh, since fracking was unleashed here. Um, but we're still importing 25% of our oil, and that means we have to be very concerned about events in other parts of the world, particularly the Persian Gulf. And we have intervened there in every conceivable fashion uh, ever since the Jimmy Carter uh, administration and the Carter Doctrine that said a invasion of the Middle East will be viewed as an attack on the United States. Fracking has unleashed uh, enormous amounts of oil and natural gas production uh, in the U.S. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about its potential for poisoning water supplies, but it's also responsible for earthquakes. It's a little weird to get your head around, but in the production, of, in the process of fracking, they produce a lot of contaminated uh, water, which they inject under high pressure in deep wells to dispose of it. And if you think of um, you know, the plates of the earth, right, that are trying to slide across each other, and they don't because of friction. If you drill a well in that and pump water in under high pressure and make a little space between, you just lubricated the joint, and it slides. And so we're seeing a dramatic increase here in the number of earthquakes in parts of the country that were not previously earthquake prone. So far, very few of them have been very damaging, um, but it's something that's, that's being monitored closely. Um, a number of states have changed rules about the uh, injection of, of fracking wastes uh, to try and curb this problem before it gets too serious. <coughs> Acid rain, this got talked about a lot 20 and 30 years ago. Um, the amount of uh, acidic uh, emissions that we're producing has dropped a lot, uh, but it's, it's still a problem. This is the uh, Smoky Mountain National Park. It was a place I visited regularly when I was a kid, um, and back then it was all green. And it's not anymore. And the acids that we form in our smokestacks and put into the air come down. The rain and the snow are dramatically more acidic uh, than they used to be. And that causes uh, metals, particularly aluminum, to leach out of the soil. Uh, and the plants take it up, and it's toxic to them. And usually that itself doesn't kill the tree. But it puts it in a, a state of serious stress and weakens it. And then uh, disease and insects, in this case bark beetles, come in and kill the trees. One of the things that goes up our smokestacks is mercury. And the amount of mercury is fairly small, but mercury is incredibly uh, toxic. And it's estimated 600,000 babies in this country are born to a mother whose bloodstream has a level of mercury that's shown to interfere with proper neurological development. I think this is a crime. How many total births are there? Four million, yeah. So it's 600,000 out of four million. Um, the way this, this happens is the Mercury goes up from the smokestacks, uh, primarily from coal-fired power plants, but also in particular from uh, incineration, municipal waste incineration and medical waste incineration. Uh, it comes down in the rain, and in the water, it's very, very dilute. 
And so it seemed at first when people were studying this, it was absurd that this could cause a real problem. Um, but what happens is when plants take up the water, their tissues concentrate the mercury by a factor of roughly 10. It depends on the plant species. And then when the fish eat the plants, it concentrates the mercury by a factor of 10. And the bigger fish eats the little fish and concentrate. And so when you get up at the top of the food chain with the carnivore fish, you can have mercury in their tissues 100,000 times as concentrated as the mercury in the water that they're swimming in. And we eat the fish. We eat the fish, and then it enters the, the bloodstream, and it's particularly a concern, and again, with pregnant women, um, which is why there's fish advisories for pregnant women, and uh, interferes with the neurological development of their unborn child. Michigan is very much uh, a part of this. This is the concentration of uh, mercury. Um, we're in the overall hot spot, maybe not the very hot spot, but it's definitely uh, a condition here in Michigan. <coughs> If you look at what comes out of power plants, right, 77% of the gases that create uh, acid rain are from power plants. 50% um, of the mercury, as well as toxic metals, arsenic, nickel, chromium, they're all just tiny little components of the coal, and we burn them, and they end up in the air. But perhaps the, the thing that's killing us most from our uh, air pollution <coughs> is particulates. Tiny little bits of unburned material, usually carbon, sometimes sulfates, uh, that are emitted from the uh, power plants. And the very smallest ones, the, the larger ones, our lungs know how to deal with. Right? We evolved to uh, stop dust and pollen from penetrating into our lungs. Our lungs are lined with cilia. But the very smallest particles, particles less than two and a half microns, go right through that penetration, enter through our lung tissue into our bloodstream where they cause heart attacks and strokes. Um, and it's estimated that these particles are causing 200,000 premature deaths in the United States every year. Um, between 1980 and 2000, our lifespans here in the U.S. increased by 2.7 years, and they're estimating 15% of that uh, came about because of the reduction in particulates as a result of the Clean Air Act. Again, Michigan is uh, not in the worst of this, but we're definitely in the particulate plume. Um, a recent study showed that an increase of 10 micrograms per cubic liter, and if you look at this, you know, we're in the realm of 11 to 12 micrograms versus out here they've got zero, so that's an increase of about 10, will increase women's risks of fatal heart attacks by 42%. Did you know this? So pollution matters. And notice I haven't even mentioned global warming yet. Right? So it's kind of a pet peeve of mine that uh, when people talk about pollution now, they almost make it a synonym with global warming as if that was the only pollutant we need to be concerned with. And I disagree. Uh, our air pollution is causing shorter life, strokes, heart disease, asthma, lung cancer, reduced lung function and low birth weight. Those are the things we're really rather sure of based on the studies. There are implications tying it to learning disabilities, Alzheimer's, depression, autism, obesity, birth defects, and diabetes, a number of which are pandemic in our society right now. But we gotta talk about climate change. CO2 is continuing to collect in our atmosphere. This is the concentration of CO2 starting back in 1960. Uh, the line is jagged uh, as we go through our seasons. Uh, trees collect uh, CO2 during the summer as their leaves fall and decay during the winter. It releases some of that back, so you get this seasonal jaggedness, but there's an undeniable long-term trend. Um, our CO2 levels are up 30%. Uh, methane, which is also a very potent um, global warming gas, uh, is up 140%. And our concentration of CO2 is the highest in the last 800,000 years. Now, of course, that means that 800,000 years ago it was actually higher, right? So the Earth goes through cycles, and it's just one more cycle. Well, 800,000 years ago, there were no homo sapiens on the planet. That's how long ago that was. 
otherwise. Um, meanwhile, our measured temperatures are on a uh, in clear uh, increasing trend across the years, which is hardly surprising given the CO2 trend. And if you don't believe the thermometers, uh, the Arctic is melting back. It uh, doesn't show very well, but the area covered by Arctic ice uh, has been decreasing steadily. The ice has also been getting thinner. And the area of the North Pole has shrunk by 10 times the area of the United Kingdom. Most of us aren't really familiar with the North Pole. We don't really look at the map and see how big that is, but it, it's getting rapidly smaller and thinner. So starting in the uh, 1950s and 60s, the US Navy was measuring the thickness of the North Pole. Because as part of the Cold War, we would hide nuclear submarines under the ice. And they'd want to be able to set up a bomb, blow up the ice, break through the ice, and launch their missiles in the event of nuclear war. And so they were measuring the thickness of the North Pole. They mapped it out very carefully. And what we're discovering is that it's um, getting rapidly thinner. So how are we reacting to this? Well, we're reacting by pumping larger quantities of CO2 into the air every year. Not really what you'd want uh, to the reaction to be. Um, and the per capita emissions of CO2 are uh, much higher in the US than in China, Europe, the rest of the world, just as our energy consumption is higher. Uh, obviously, consequential to that is our CO2 emissions are higher. So how much would we need to cut our CO2 emissions to bring the uh, environment back into balance? Um, the IPPC, uh, which is the UN organization studying global warming, uh, say that you know we're emitting um, 6.92 billion tons of uh, carbon a year. That's about 0.9 tons per person, right? 0.9 tons of carbon or 3.3 tons of CO2. It can get confusing reading this because some things report carbon weight, some report CO2 weight. The CO2 is heavier because you've added oxygen to it. Um, to keep global CO2 levels before, but below 450 parts per million requires reducing emissions to 3 billion tons per year. So that's the amount that the nature, natural processes, particularly uh, rain and uh, some other things in the atmosphere, can remove CO2. They can, they can remove 3 billion tons of carbon a year, um, but we're uh, emitting uh, 6.92, so we need to cut our CO2 emissions 57%. Now that doesn't sound too bad, right? More than half, you can cut it down. We'll take a brief pause on uh, the musical rendition. So that sounds eminently doable, right? We can cut our emissions 57%. I mean, that's going to take some work, but it's doable. But remember, our CO2 emissions are not evenly distributed. Um, so if you look at different countries, you know, Bangladesh down here doesn't need to cut at all because their CO2 emissions per person are already below what uh, nature can remove. But, you know, in Canada, Australia, and the United States here, we're, we're way above that and we need to cut down to, to here. So uh, what would that look like? And, um, you know, I had to do the, the calculation. So, our emissions are about 15 and a half tons of CO2 per person. The target's one and a half tons, so we need to cut 90%. <laughs> now, I'm guessing this is a pretty climate change aware audience. Had any of you heard that number before? Yeah. Me? I, I, I went out and I looked, and, and, and I didn't find it anywhere. And I came up with this number, and I'm like, can that really be true? And then I found this chart, and it's like, well, yeah. I think they don't want to tell us this, because if we heard it, we might get hopeless. <laughs> so this is where our CO2 comes from. Electricity generation uh, is the lead at 40%. Transportation, another 34%. So imagine if all of our electricity production was zero carbon. It was all wind, solar, whatever. And all of our vehicles were electric vehicles charged off of that zero carbon uh, power system. That would reduce us 74%. We wouldn't really get to the 90. But it'd sure be a good start. So let's start there. Let's not lose hope. Let's light a candle rather than curse the darkness. And let's talk about the war on coal. <laughs> um, electricity production from coal in the United States is on a uh, steep decline. 
Uh, if you look just back in 2003, we were getting 51% of our electricity from coal and 17% from natural gas. Now we're getting 30% from coal and 32% from natural gas. The decline in coal use in this country is driven only in very small part by solar and wind. It's driven primarily by cheap natural gas, which came about from fracking. So our electric grid is getting cleaner, and our uh, emissions of all of those nasty chemicals and CO2 are all falling as a result of fracking. These are uh, coal power plants in the US. Uh, these green ones here were proposed and defeated. Uh, and amongst existing plants, we've got the, the sort of reddish pinkish ones here were retired and retirements announced. There are a lot of coal plants closing in the country. They tend to be the older plants and the smaller plants. Um, but they, they are closing. Uh, if you look at this trend in Michigan, um, back in 2009, we had 66% of our electricity came from coal, and now that's down to 36%. So Michigan's definitely a, a part of this trend, moving away from coal and to uh, natural gas. And a little bit of wind. DCE made a really dramatic announcement here. Uh, they said they're going to reduce their CO2 emissions 80% by 2050. 2050 is a long time away. A lot can happen between now and then with an announcement. But they said a 30% reduction by the early 2020s, 45% by 2030. They're going to add 6 gigawatts of renewable energy, 3.5 gigawatts of natural gas, with a steady retirement of coal plants, 11 by the early 2020s. Three of them were retired in 2016. And they'll be at zero coal by 2040. Uh, the DTE CEO said that the goal is 40% renewable energy, mostly wind, because, and I quote, wind continues to be substantially cheaper. This is an economic decision made for economic drivers, which is why the price of renewable energy is so terribly important. If you look at uh, investments being made in uh, power plants, um, Let's see, we have fossil and nuclear here, so in 2016, uh, this is the investment in billions of US dollars here in uh, fossil plants and nuclear plants. This is the investment in solar PV, in wind energy, in large scale hydro, biopower, and other. The point I want to make here is that we are consistently, year after year, investing more in solar and wind than we are in fossil fuels and nuclear combined. I think that's really impressive. It's very slow to change how your entire fleet of power plants is generating electricity because power plants last a long time. They may uh, be in operation for 40 years, 60 years, 100 years, um, and, but we're constantly replacing them. We're constantly building new ones. Uh, and, and so looking at where we're investing in the new ones is really telling you the direction of the future. Global electric production, um, if you look here, non-renewable electricity uh, is still three quarters of it. The renewables are about a quarter, but a big chunk of that is hydropower. Uh, wind's about 4%, solar PV is about 1.5%, so wind and PV, 5.5% of global electric production. Uh, this was in 2016. They're growing so fast, I think 2017 would be about 6.5%. So it's moving. So when we look at renewable energy systems and we talk about how much renewable energy costs, and this is so central to the discussions right now, right? 30 years ago, they said renewable energy just didn't work. And then when it worked over and over again, they said, well, renewable energy just can't scale. And then when we built 100 megawatt wind farms, they said, well, it's just too expensive. And that's where the argument is riding right now, but um, the, it's not just the trends are in our favor, the facts are in our favor. Uh, there's two ways to look at the pricing here. Uh, the easy way to get good numbers is the installed cost per watt of generating capacity, right? This is a real one-time cost. When you build the thing, you know what it costs, right? Um, it, it, it's very clean. 
Within uh, policy and regulatory areas, they like to use the levelized cost of energy. So if you have this system, whatever it is that's going to generate electricity, what did it build to cost? What did it build to feed it fuels if necessary to maintain it through that lifetime? What was its total lifetime cost? How much electricity did it generate over that lifetime? Divide the two, and you get this levelized cost. But um, inherent in that calculation are some assumptions about interest rates, the cost of equity, and tax policy. Right? which can complicate all that. So uh, if people are projecting the levelized cost of something we just built, uh, it, it's still subject to, you can have different studies come up with different numbers. Right? Whereas if you just say, well, what did it cost to build it? Well, that, that's pretty clear. Um, Lazard is a uh, consulting firm that computes levelized costs of power production for all these different technologies. They release this on a regular basis. This is their uh, 11th revision uh, of their report. Um, and the, the bars here, so let's just take solar PV rooftop residential, right? Those are costing something between $187 and $319 per megawatt hour of electricity produced. Okay, most of us don't deal in megawatt hours, right? So what's that mean? Well, it's not too hard to slide the decimal point over, and this would be 18.7 cents per kilowatt hour. Still pretty pricey, right? What do people pay for electricity? What's on your electric bill in terms of cents per kilowatt hour? Not how many dollars a month, right? Because I don't know how much you use. Hmm? 0.076 per kilowatt. <laughs> The total, my total, total bill in, in, from December, the total kilowatts and then the total lot time is close to 18, but I pay an extra penny a kilowatt hour for 100% renewable. Right, right, yeah. I was going to say, so up at mine, it's about 17. I'm paying two cents for the renewable, so it's really 15, right? The 7.6 that you're looking at is one of the charges on your bill. I'm sure that number appears there, right? But they'll typically break out the generation cost and the transmission and distribution costs separately, and you've got to add those up. Electric bills are very confusing, right? I, I like his approach. You just take the total bill and you see how many kilowatt hours that I use and you divide. That's really what you're paying, right? Um, whether it's taxes or fees or, or you know, uh, a lot of different ways it's broken out. Anyway. Looking at this, uh, let's look at the cheapest things, right? The things furthest to the left. And those would be uh, gas combined cycle, right? Uh, lots of um, natural gas power plants uh, being built around the country. Um, wind, lots of wind farms being built. And solar PV, thin film or crystalline utility scale. These are the cheapest ways to generate electricity right now. And if you look at what's being built in the country, it's exactly those three things. There are very few coal plants and only two nuclear plants under construction in the country. It's all about gas, wind, and solar, particularly gas and wind. And do these figures include the cost of storage? Since different forms the storage of electricity, they energy. do not, no. That's a very good point. They also do not include uh, any sort of government incentives or subsidies. So things like the production tax credit and the investment tax credit do not show up on this chart. They actually have another chart just like it that includes those, that uh, shifts the renewables significantly to the left. Uh, you showed how uh, Michigan was bigger than the rest of the states in gas storage. Yes. How does it store, how does it rank with other states with uh, energy storage? In terms of electricity? Well, like, like, uh, yeah, yeah. So um, if you look at how utilities can balance out their load by storing uh, energy temporarily, right, the predominantly and leading way that's done all across the world is not with batteries. That's what you read about right now. Batteries, batteries, and there's some of that being done, uh, particularly in Hawaii and California. Uh, but the predominant way it's done is with pump storage. And again, Michigan kind of falls right in line with that. We have the Ludington Pump Storage Facility. It was uh, built uh, when uh, two of our nuclear power plants were constructed, so the power plants could be run uh, all through the night. And at night, they pump water uh, up into the reservoir on the hill, and during the day when we need the electricity, they run it down through turbines and generate electricity. And it acts in net like a giant battery. Um, specifically to your question, I don't know how we rank with other so states. My information is that there's only five states that have more energy storage. 
I believe that. I believe that, yeah. Uh, that there's not a lot of pump storage facilities in the U.S. Yeah. California has uh, water reservoirs in the mountains. And so at night, they pump residential water up into the mountains. And in the daytime, they get the water and the power back. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority is the other area where people pump up a dam and then they get back the next day. They're also in Iowa doing some energy storage with compressed air and underground caverns, but I don't have any figures on that. If you look at the deployment of solar and wind uh, as a percentage of electricity supply, uh, Europe's in the lead. What we've got here is blue for wind and red for solar. Uh, they're getting you know, 11 plus percent of their total electricity from wind and solar. But the United States is uh, second there, uh, maybe six and a half percent. Japan, though know, Japan is predominantly solar rather than wind, which is different than all the other countries, right? And this development is, is ongoing. So this is where I said, you know, in the beginning, uh, solar and wind are now no longer trivial, right? You can't say 11% of your production is trivial. They're still pretty small. So again, if we're going to not only make our electric production uh, green, but we're going to make our transportation sector green, uh, right now it looks like the way that's going to happen is electric vehicles, right? For a while, bets were on hydrogen and fuel cells. Uh, that's uh, discussion has dramatically shifted to electric vehicles. Electric vehicle sales are climbing fast. Uh, this is global figures. This is plug-in vehicles. So this would be either an all-electric vehicle or a plug-in hybrid. Um, the bars here show the number of vehicles sold in the year, and uh, these are in thousands, right? And then the orange exponential curve, there's the total number of vehicles uh, in operation. There are 3.1 million plug-in vehicles in operation in the world. Now, it seems kind of strange to us here, I think, because Michigan is not where they are, <laughs> okay? About half of them are in China. And within the U.S., the concentration is highly in California, right? Uh, so we don't encounter them nearly so much. Uh, but there's still less than 1.5% of sales and 0.3% of the total vehicle fleet. Not enough to make much difference yet. Um, and we'll see if the growth trends continue or not. Uh, this shows where they're uh, selling. So you can see the United States. You get two shades of red here. United States down here. China, uh, about half of the world's uh, sales. <coughs> Our color codes. Oh, the European Union, Norway. Norway has the highest per capita concentration of electric vehicles in the world. So if anybody says electric vehicles don't work in cold climates, um, uh, yeah. These are projections of electric vehicle sales uh, from two different uh, consulting firms showing these exponential growths. The uh, U.S. Infor uh, Energy Information Administration is not so uh, rosy about their future. Um, I'm not big on these kind of projections because I've just seen them be wrong over and over and over again. Uh, time will tell uh, what comes from that. But suppose we were going to replace our fleet of petroleum-powered internal combustion engine vehicles with electric vehicles. What would that mean to the electric grid? Here in the U.S., we drive about 3 trillion miles a year. That's one with 12 zeros, right? And as I look at different electric vehicles out there, they get roughly three miles to a kilowatt hour. Just like we say, how many miles per gallon? We get three miles to a kilowatt hour, right? Um, so at three miles per kilowatt hour, we need to have a trillion kilowatt hours of electric production if all of our transportation was going to be electrified. Uh, we're producing almost four trillion kilowatt hours, so we need to increase our production by about a quarter. I think that's just an interesting statistic, right? If you did that and you said, well, we have to increase our electricity production tenfold, that would be very disturbing. 25% um, is, is doable, particularly if the vehicles are charged at night when so many of the power plants are idle, although that might not apply if more of the power plants are solar, in which case we might actually want to charge them midday. The automakers are all in a race. The, the news is, is full of electric vehicle news. Uh, France and the United Kingdom have banned internal combustion engines by 2040. Wow. 
EW has pledged $40 billion in uh, research and development money. That's not development. That's not actual production money over the next five years. Yes? Is this a ban or is this a ban on production? <coughs> That's a great question. I believe it's a ban on new sales, not operation. Uh, there are 24 EV modules available in North America right now. I surely could have named them, and uh, there's only two or three that are really dominating sales. Uh, GM has pledged two new EV models in 18 months and 20 by 2023. Ford's going to invest $11 billion in EVs by 2022. That was just in the recent news. Daimler has uh, pledged $10 billion. There's a lot of investment and a lot of R&D uh, going into electric vehicles. There's a lot of policy discussions about uh, recharging stations and how we're going to do that. Um, but we're going to move on from electric vehicles and talk about wind power. Um, so I'm going to talk about gigawatts of electric generating capacity. And it's, it's kind of a big number, right? So for comparison here, uh, a large power plant is about one gigawatt. So the Fermi nuclear plant is 1.1 gigawatts. Um, total electric generating capacity in Michigan is 30 gigawatts. In the United States, 1,074 gigawatts. And I'm just throwing those numbers out so when I show you other numbers, you have a basis of comparison, right? Is, is 400 gigawatts big or small, right? And, and well, it's, it's pretty big, right? And, yes? Is that per year? No, so this is generating capacity. This is how much, if all of our power plants ran at the same time, how much power they'd put out. Now, we don't run every power plant all the time, right? They're shifted to meet demand. And so we call that comparison a capacity factor, right? What percent of their theoretical output are they actually producing the way we operate them? So if you look at, say, a nuclear plant, they're operated uh, pretty much 7 by 24 unless they're down for refueling or maintenance of some kind. And they typically have a capacity factor of 98%. Right? They're putting out pretty much as much power as they're ready to put out all the time. If you look at wind or solar, where you don't decide how much it's going to produce in general, right? I mean, you might cap it on rare occasions, but in general, it's maybe a 30% capacity factor on uh, wind, or sometimes 40 in a very good wind site, um, or solar down at 20, 25% of capacity. So if you compare a gigawatt of wind with a gigawatt nuclear power plant, you're kind of comparing apples and oranges, because the nuclear plant's going to put out more power, more total energy, same power, more energy over the year, uh, because it's operating 7 by 24. So this is a global capacity and installation of wind. So the total bar here is the amount of wind capacity uh, that's installed and operating. And the top there is the amount that got added. So at the end of 2016 in the world, we had 287 gigawatts of wind power production or capacity. Given that the whole US is 1,074, that's a lot. This is not true. And 55 of that was added uh, during the year. About half of that was in China. China is the world leader in EVs, solar, and photovoltaic, and wind. And it's not a small leadership. <laughs> They're way out ahead. So here you see uh, China's installed base and their additions during the year. Uh, the US is number two here, um, and other countries uh, behind that. Yes, that would be per capita. That would be a great number to know, uh, or per dollar of GDP, and I don't have those numbers. Uh, but obviously, China's population is about four times the size of the US, so if I did it per capita, whoosh, yeah, it would look good. I want to talk about, about grid stability. So um, aside from, well, renewables are just too expensive, this is getting a lot of attention now. Well, wind and solar are intermittent, and uh, if we put too much of them on the grid, the grid's going to become unstable. No doubt that's true if you don't take you know, remedial measures. Um, but 20 years ago, people were saying, well, you know, more than 10 or 20 percent, and you know, you're, you're going to kill the grid. That has not proven to be true. Uh, Germany's grid is 30 percent renewable energy. Denmark is getting 38 percent of its power from wind. And wind is the most erratic, uh, the least predictable source of renewable energy around. They're successfully getting 38% of the power from wind. Their grid is not collapsing. However, the way they're enabled to do that is that during periods of low consumption and high wind, so windy nights, 
Denmark is pumping electricity into its neighbors and, and flooding them with uh, low-cost wind power um, and causing them to dial down their uh, fossil fuel power plants um, by, by flooding them with wind. So you need a good, strong grid in time, somebody else to soak up the excess uh, at that level. Uh, Iowa is getting 30%. 36% of its electric power from wind, um, the leading state in the country. But my point is, one way or another, these grids have all remained stable. It's, it, it's, it's possible, it's doable. This is wind power deployments in the various states in the US. Um, in terms of wind capacity, Michigan's 14th uh, in the country. Texas is uh, far and away uh, the leader, uh, followed by uh, Iowa and Oklahoma. Uh, notice that neighboring states of ours, uh, Minnesota, Illinois, uh, have substantially more uh, wind power installed than we do. Uh, it's not a question of geography and the resource, it's a question of policy and will. Um, and we can do it here. They're talking about solar photovoltaics. Um, this is the same sort of chart. The total bar is the uh, amount installed, and the top part is the amount uh, installed in the last year. So we have 303 gigawatts of solar power in the world. That's 10 times the generating capacity of Michigan. Not too shabby. And 75 of that was added last year. Now, if you remember the wind graph, 55 gigawatts of wind were added in 2016. 75 gigawatts of solar. Solar started its growth much later than wind. Wind was cheaper sooner. Solar's gotten cheap lately, and so the installation rates have skyrocketed, and solar is catching up. Just as we saw in wind, the majority of this is in China. Uh, China has uh, installed about half of the additional capacity installed uh, in the year in solar as well. And uh, Japan, Germany, the US are all similar in solar capacity. You see our addition was uh, second largest to China. Um, one of the things that's happened when solar started, solar was very expensive and it was about off-grid applications, starting with satellites, which is about as off-grid as you can get. Um, then moving to things like microwave relay stations that were on mountaintops, uh, remote uh, ranches for pumping water, right? And uh, off-grid is now a tiny, tiny sliver across the top here, that little gray off-grid sliver, right? It's still being done, it's still very important. Um, there are some great new applications being found, but in terms of the overall uh, industry of solar power, it's tiny. Um, Next we have grid connected decentralized. So this is solar panels on people's roofs uh, or on say the big box stores that we're seeing a lot now with uh, Walmart and other companies putting uh, solar on their roof. Uh, that's growing, but as a percentage of solar installs, it's rapidly shrinking because what's really taking over the industry is grid connected centralized, which means uh, utility scale plants where they cover fields of acres or hundreds of acres with solar panels. And that's been the real growth story of late. This has been driven by the fact that solar PV systems are plunging in price, and this is continuing, by the way. 50% uh, in 10 years. Recent years, we're still seeing drops of you know, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10% in the price each year. Um, so I talked about how you can go from the cost per watt of a system where you can try and compute a levelized cost of energy. The other way of getting to that is to look at power purchase agreements. So uh, large uh, installations, either of wind or solar, will sign an agreement to sell their output to a utility for a period of 20 years at a fixed price. These power purchase agreements then give you an indicator of what it really costs to generate electricity because some company has put their financial ass on the line and saying we will sell this power at this price for a fixed rate for 20 years. And what we're seeing in solar in the US, you look at these US locations in Nevada, California, Texas, and Arizona, really nice sunny places, right? They are signing 20-year contract to sell power at about four cents a kilowatt hour. And there was a more recent one in Tucson, Arizona at three cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, we're seeing that in other countries, the UAE, China, uh, Mexico, uh, again, down at the three cents a kilowatt hour kind of price. 
This is how cheap solar has gotten and why utilities are now installing massive fields of photovoltaics, which we never saw in the past. This is right here in Michigan. This is a uh, final pier. We've got a um, 50 megawatt, 200 acre photovoltaic system. And there's a 21 megawatt one being planned uh, in Joseph County. Um, you have to look at this from the air or you can't see it, right? Because it's huge. And there's, yes? Yeah, do you have any data on that field on its peak coincidence? I do not. Um, it just went into operation a couple months ago, so they wouldn't have that across a uh, calendar year yet. Um, but I don't think you need to study the particular plant, right? If they have oriented their panels due south, and I don't know, uh, but that's the standard procedure, right? The uh, coincidence of that has been well studied. DTE um, did installations, you know, 15 years ago uh, to study exactly that. And experiments on orienting the panels uh, in different ways to match that. This can also be done by anyone individually very easily. You can go to PV Watts, which is a uh, website, pvwatts.com, uh, I think, or org. I don't know. Just do a search on PD Watts, it'll come up. And you can create any fantasy solar installation, and they will give you its projected output um, by hour for every hour of the year, right? To get to coincide, you'd have to know what the demand curve is for the particular utility. And if you know where I can get those, I would like to get my hands on that information. Well, one of the major track, uh, one, one axis tracking companies yes. has said anything north of Columbus, Ohio, they're probably not worth putting a track on. However, there is a 20 megawatt system near Bowling Green, Ohio, mm -hmm. which is north of Columbus. And, and they have both some rigid, uh, some non-moving south-facing panels on their grid. And, um, and then they have this new 20 megawatt. And they said that last summer, over the summer, the peak coincidence for the rigid ones were 40%. And for the tracker that they just brought online a year ago, it was 90%. Would you do me a favor and send me a link to that information? Because I've actually been looking for that source. I don't know that it's actually public, but yeah. I can ask. But I can ask in my sources if you would share it. Um, that array has been very. Now in the winter time, it's not as good because it's a one-way tracker. So at noon in, in the winter, it's not very good. But when the winter isn't our peak demand time anyway. Um, but that coincidence was uh, uh, remarkable. So this is a big discussion point. I want to kind of break this. I know he knows what he's talking about. But, um, <laughs> so if you have an intermittent energy source like this, the question is, how do you meet fluctuating demand? And it's very nice if your source happens to match roughly what the demand is, both through the hours of the day and seasonally. So certainly in Michigan and in most of the country, our peak demand is in the summer when we have a lot of air conditioning running. Uh, in particular, in the summer, um, sort of not noon, but later in the afternoon and actually in the evening, about 6 p.m., when the office buildings are still air conditioning and we all drive home and turn on our air conditioners at home and fire up the electric stove and the microwave and the television and our peak demand can hit right there at six. This has been a big problem in California, which has a very high solar penetration, that the solar is producing, you know, at noon and one and two in the afternoon very nicely, but at that peak at 6 p.m., they're down to close to zero if they've done a fixed amount facing due south. Now, there's a couple of ways with solar you can try and address that. He's talking about one, which is you put it on a mount that tracks the sun across the sky, and therefore it turns west as the sun's going down. And its output will go down somewhat, because the sun's coming in uh, through more atmosphere and at a low angle, it, it's gonna be less, but it captures much more of it than a fixed mount. The other alternative is to position a fixed solar panel, but not face them to yourself. Tilt them somewhat west. You're gonna produce less kilowatt hours per year, but they're going to be produced more in the afternoon hours, which is when there's actually more demand. Yes? And what's nice for that system in Bowling Green is that Ohio is on the PDM system, which reaches out to New Jersey. And so they have the advantage of being on the west end of yes. their uh, rate structure. The other way 
to address this is with transmission, right? So if the peak demand on the northeast coast where we have a huge amount of population, right, is at 6 p.m., well, that's only 3 p.m. in California, right? Um, so, and, and there's been some of that in, in Europe that talked about long-range transmission to, to try and uh, adjust for these peaks. All right. Uh, jobs. So I had to have at least one slide about jobs. If you look at the United States here, right, uh, this is jobs in millions. Oh, no, can't be millions. Hundreds of thousands. So 242,000 jobs in solar PV in the United States. Um, the industry uh, group says 260,000, close enough. Uh, 102,000 in wind power, right? There's a lot of jobs in this, and I'm going to talk about why that's important a little bit later here. Um, if we look at renewable energy in Michigan, um, renewables are 7.3% of our total energy, right, versus a US average of 9.5%. Um, so, you know, we're a little behind. Electricity production is 10% owing to the uh, renewable portfolio standard that was passed in 2008. Um, that still ranks as 26, so about in the middle. Um, but we have passed a RPS for 15% in, um, well, we passed in 2016 by 2021. Uh, that'll um, drive increases in that if they wouldn't have been driven by other means. Uh, utility scale solar, wind, and geothermal production, 1.3% of the US puts us number 15. Utility scale wind farms, we're number 15. Ethanol production, we're over 12. Um, nothing really remarkable here, right? We're not leaders, we're not, we do pay uh, higher than average residential electric rates uh, in Michigan, and I looked at that, and it's not really that our overall electric rates are higher, it's that the residential rates are higher, um, which I guess has something to do with the, the way it's regulated. Uh, renewable electricity in Michigan, 72% wind. We've got some hydroelectric, a little biomass, landfill gas. So if you see we've got landfills and they're drawing the gas out of that, uh, the biogas that's produced and running generators with it, municipal solid waste. But the point is it's predominantly wind and solar is really tiny. Um, that installation at um, Lapeer that I showed you the picture of increased the total solar generating capacity of Michigan by about half. <laughs> This is the growth of renewable energy in Michigan. Uh, you see there just wasn't much uh, here until 2008. Uh, we had a number of policy changes there, including the RPS. And you'll see most of this is wind, wind, wind. And you've got these tiny little bars here of geothermal, uh, distributed solar and utility solar. It's pretty much all about wind. Uh, where is this in the, in the state? Uh, it's predominantly uh, in the thumb here. And then we've got a concentration out here um, between uh, Alma and Mount Pleasant and a few other installations around the state, but predominantly in the thumb. Um, I used to sit in an office that was along uh, I-696. Uh, I would watch or the uh, trucks go by with the wind turning blades on them. And like, headed to the thumb march, you know? Michigan has very significant renewable energy potential. This was a study done by a consulting group, and uh, they said by 2030, it is perfectly practical for Michigan to get 40% of its electricity needs from renewables, 30% of that being wind. So they're still looking at wind as the uh, predominant source, and uh, some solar and some central biomass power. Yes? Uh, uh, industrial scale wind turbine, one megawatt? I mean, does that, that 36,000 translate into how many? 360 or uh, well, See, this is actual electricity production in gigawatt hours. Okay. So, again, you get that capacity versus the annual What are we talking about? 10,000 wind turbines or 5,000? Well, 5, let's just try it this way. How many wind turbines are in the state now? Gee, I don't know, but they're producing, what we say, 4% of our electricity or something? So if we're going to go to 30, whatever we have now, you'd have to multiply that by 7. And they get us to 40%. 30% wind. So, I mean, basically we'd see wind turbines every agricultural area in Michigan. 
to get sure. I would not say that because they're going to concentrate in locations of uh, better wind. So it's not going to be evenly distributed. You're going to find incredible concentrations in some places and nothing in other places. Um, other than the, the thumb, I mean, the best wind source in Michigan is right along the coast. <laughs> And it's very hard to build there because the real estate's really expensive and, and you've got rich people that don't want to look at wind turbines. Um, but this study must have taken that into account that, well, well they're saying it, it's possible, but is it practically achievable because of our people going to vis yeah. visibly allow So the study that. looked at the natural resource and it looked at the economics. I don't think they looked at the political backlash that <coughs> which is important, but it's really hard to predict. So what does renewable energy cost in Michigan? Well, the Public Service Commission, as part of the uh, law that passed the Renewable Portfolio Standard, is required to do an analysis of this every year. And they look at uh, power purchase agreements entered into by Consumers Energy and Detroit Edison, um, spread across wind, um, biodigesters, uh, biomass, landfill gas, hydro, and solar. And they compare this to, they did a study and said, if Michigan needed to add electric generating capacity, which we don't because electricity demand has been flat or declining uh, for a decade, um, but there was, a, there was a proposal to build a new coal-fired power plant in the Bay City area. And they determined that that would cost about $133 per megawatt hour of electricity uh, life cycle cost of that plant. And the wind PPAs that are coming in are at $71, uh, substantially less. And even the solar ones are coming in less than that cost. Now, it's a little bit of an unfair comparison um, because nobody's building coal power plants anymore, right? Uh, they're building natural gas power plants. The current uh, discussion, there's an analysis going on in the Public Service Commission right now, and they're saying a new natural gas power plant is somewhere between nine and 10 cents. Uh, a kilowatt hour or it'd be uh, 90 or $100 per megawatt hour. So still more expensive than wind, uh, cheaper than solar, right? But it's dispatchable. You can turn it on when you need it, right? Can't do that with the wind. Um, both of these energy sources are growing rapidly. And like most industries, they have economies of scale. So the more of them we build, the better we get at it. Uh, in a whole variety of ways, and every time global wind power doubles, we see a 19% drop in cost. Now, I don't know that that can continue forever, but it's been continuing throughout the, the lifespan of the wind industry. Solar, every time it doubles, costs are falling 24%. As the prices fall, that stimulates demand, right? There's more applications where it's economical, more it gets installed, which makes more economies of scale, which makes the price fall in a virtuous cycle. Meanwhile, uh, electric utility rates are not falling, they're going up, or at least the residential ones. And so obviously, if the solar is getting cheaper, electricity is getting more expensive uh, at some point. But those cross, and this becomes highly desirable. But not someday. It's already happened. So uh, this was a Department of Energy study that was done, and they looked at 50 of the largest American cities today. And they said, suppose a homeowner put a solar system in, and they financed it in their 30-year mortgage. Would their savings in electricity exceed the increase in their mortgage or not? And what they found was that in 93% of the single-family households in 50 largest cities, it would save you money. Um, and that was conducted a couple of years ago, and the prices have fallen since then. Uh, as you might imagine, the utility companies are not wild about that. So that was based on just the kilowatt, as if you had 100% of that metering like the They were assuming that metering, yes. Um, so if you look here uh, in Michigan, a typical install is about five kilowatts on a home system, which costs about $15,000, about $3 a watt on a uh, small scale system right now, about a dollar a watt on the utility scale systems. It's about $15,000. You can get a 30% uh, investment tax credit on that, which knocks you down to, to very rough figures, right? $10,000, we're trying to keep things to round numbers. 
I've done this in very exact figures and spreadsheets and stuff, but uh, in mid-Michigan, that would produce about 6,300 kilowatt hours a year, saving about $800 a year. This would more than cover the payment of adding $10,000 to a 30-year mortgage. It would not cover the payment on a 15-year home equity loan. Right, I compared it across all your different kind of loan types and then said, you know, what, what can you do there? So it is a, mar with net metering, it is a marginally good uh, investment and there's good reason to do it if you have a uh, suitable location and you're going to be there for a while because it's hard to say if you sell your house what the new purchaser is going to value that system at, right? <laughs> the utilities really didn't like this. They shouldn't. <laughs> so energy uh, CEO said that uh, small scale wind, solar, and net metering constitute a mortal threat to the existing utility system. And it's true. Uh, the Detroit Edison Institute warned of irreparable damages to revenues and growth prospects of the utilities. This was out of Forbes in 2013. Why did 2013 this start? Well, it started with the uh, Edison Electric Institute doing a study on this, and, and you understand the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. So the things the utilities are worrying about happening, they didn't have to forecast and guess, it was happening in California and Hawaii. In Hawaii, one quarter of all homes have solar systems on their roofs, and you know they're flooding power into the grid during the day and drawing it out at night, creating you know operational problems for the grid and wiping out residential sales. Yes. In uh, this old house episode, uh, they're requiring storage for uh, systems in Hawaii now. Yeah. I didn't know they were requiring it, but I know no, it's I being done. Construction. Okay. Okay. If you believe this. Old the, well, there's a. <laughs> I know there was a substantial um, utility scale solar system put in with storage as part of it, and I got figures on what that cost and stuff. Uh, but I, I had to pare down my slides, folks. I am <laughs> looking at the time here. Uh, anyway, so they said uh, if, if PV, in 2013, PVs at home scale were costing five bucks a watt instead of three, right? And I said if it drops to 350 a watt, um, the targeted addressable market, right, people who would benefit from doing this is going to grow 500% in 18 states and 20 million homes, and, you know, so that would be a bad thing for the utilities. And then they came back in 2015 and said, oh, gee, we're already there. The solar prices were, were dropping so fast. So it's not just um, green tree huggers that are saying solar is economical. This is the utilities study, right? This is the Edison Electric Institute that uh, financed this study and came to this conclusion. Now, utilities don't have a problem with solar. They're installing it like gangbusters. They don't want us to put it on our roofs and feed it back into their grid with net metering because it's a raw deal for them. And so they're jumping on net metering, right? Um, the current state net metering policies that compensate at the retail price of electric sales to the utility are outdated and need to be updated. As long as we're connected to the grid, we still use it and we shall all continue to pay for it, right? If I put on a net metered system on my house and I'm producing the same number of kilowatt hours I produce in the year, my net bill to the utility is zero, but I'm clearly getting a benefit from using their grid. Am I costing them money? I'm certainly costing them sales. That's a point of some ferocious contention. Um, this fed into kind of uh, lobbying and the, the public opinion. This was a Wall Street Journal editorial called The Hole in the Rooftop Solar Craze. And I just love this picture. We have solar panels and money just blowing away. <laughs> So policy, which I really wanted to uh, get into here, we've got five things going on in federal policy and three things going on here right in Michigan right now that are really significant in terms of renewable energy. Um, first off, at the federal level, we have the production tax credit. Uh, this is for large scale systems and it provides a tax credit of 1.9 cents per kilowatt uh, to the producers of that power. This is expired for everything except wind power. I'm talking about this because you'll hear people say, well, you know, renewables are just too expensive, nobody would be doing them except for the subsidies. There's some truth to that. But it's changing. 
It's where it's gone for everything but wind, and wind is being phased out. It's being reduced 20% and then 40%, well, 20% last year, 40% this year, 60% in 2019, right? There's already a phase out built into this. The investment tax credit, so at the residential side, you can get a 30% uh, tax credit for uh, only solar. Used to be there was a whole list of technologies. The others have all expired: photovoltaics or domestic hot water. And there's a phase out on this: 26% um, instead of 30, starting uh, at the end of 2019, and then it's down to 22%. And fortunately, I forgot to get the, the tail end of that, but I think it drops down to, to 10%. Um, before I get into that, so my point of these two is to say that there are some very significant federal subsidies to uh, renewables right now. Commercial wind is getting the production tax credit. The smaller scale stuff is getting this investment tax credit. They already have phase outs built into them. The latest news, uh, the Trump administration has uh, put a tariff on the import of solar uh, modules and uh, cells of 30%. Uh, this is a result of a filing, oops, sorry, a filing from uh, two US solar manufacturers. Um, at least they're based here, they're actually owned by foreign companies. Um, it's 30% in the first year, and then it also has a phase out, and the first two and a half gigawatts of imported cells are excluded from the tariff. They have not yet uh, announced how that two and a half gigawatts is going to get allocated. Whether it's a first come, first serve, and we're going to have freighters full of solar steaming into the harbors on January 1st? Um, or are they going to allocate that by country or by company? Or It's unclear at this point. Um, but everything after the two and a half gigawatts, uh, and we're importing a lot more than that, is going to be subject to the tariff. Um, we're currently importing about 90% of all our solar modules. So this is very significant for the solar industry. This isn't going to you know, nip at the heels. This is, this is going to the heart of it. The uh, solar energy industry is, is estimating a loss of 23,000 solar jobs because less solar will get installed because it's more expensive. Um, mostly at the utility scale, um, because the price of the solar panels themselves is a much larger percentage of the utility scale systems. Um, and there's a significant chance this will be overturned by the World Trade Organization. Uh, several prior tariffs that were imposed under uh, the uh, ITC uh, Section 201 were overturned in the past. This makes the whole thing very uncertain, which unfortunately makes it less likely we'll get the intended benefit. Right? The intended benefit here is that we'll manufacture more panels here in the U.S., but you're not inclined to build a factory if it might get overturned in a few months, right? Um, jumping topics to PURPA. So the Public Utility Regulation Regulatory Policies Act, this was passed back in 1978 during the energy crisis. And what it says is that if you build a renewable energy facility meeting certain criteria, the utilities must buy the electric output from you uh, at a price of their avoided cost. However, it did not address how you compute the utilities avoided cost. It left that to the state regulatory agencies. And different states have taken very different methodologies to uh, how they would compute that. Um, the Union of Concerned Scientists says PURPA has been the most effective single measure in promoting renewable energy. I'm not sure I agree with that. Um, certainly the federal level would probably agree with it, but state RPSs might have more to do with it than, than PURPA. Um, our own uh, Michigan representative, Tim Walward, has introduced H.R. 4476, uh, the PURPA Modernization Act. Um, making a short story of it, it would, would make PURPA a lot less uh, potent. Uh, it would allow states to waive the most purchased obligations. So in some states, PURPA would basically become null and void. Uh, it reduces the system limit size uh, that can fall under PURPA from 20 megawatts to 2.5 megawatts. And there is some gaming in the system right now about, well, how big is your system? Are you over under 20 megawatts? And they break it up into a bunch of little ones and say, well, yeah, we're under 20. And so they're changing those rules to kind of close those loopholes, but perhaps swinging the pendulum too far the other way and making it hard to build anything if anybody else built anything in the area. Um, policy in Michigan. Uh, this is a group called Solar Power Rocks. 
uh, and they rank each of the state's uh, policies as terms of how friendly they are as a solar uh, mission and overall gets a D. Um, in part because we don't have any of these incentives. We don't have tax credits for solar or rebates or performance payments. We don't have a property tax exemption. I'm going to talk about that. We don't have a sales tax exemption. A lot of states have these things. We don't have any of those. Um, they said our RPS, they rated a D. I think that was before we passed the stronger one, but I'm not sure. Uh, there's no solar carve out. So some states say, you know, you have to have 15% renewables, but five of those percentages have to be solar. We didn't do that here. Uh, I don't think it would have been a good idea. Um, they give us a B because our electricity rates are high. Uh, so that makes solar more attractive. Uh, we gave net metering a B, which I think was before we asked the law for sending it, which I'll talk about momentarily. Um, but overall, you know, from a policy perspective, Michigan isn't really uh, friendly to solar. And of course, from a climate perspective, we don't have the best solar resource. In fact, other than Alaska, we're tied with Washington State for the worst solar resource. Um, Michigan has uh, basically revoked uh, net metering or repealed it. Um, the Public Act 341 and 342 was passed in December of 2016, directed the Michigan Public Service Commission to design a new distributed generation tariff to replace net metering. And the system size would be limited to the customer's annual usage. So they don't want you becoming a power producer and just you know, flooding the, the grid, right? Is it, this is supposed to kind of balance your, your home uh, production, which was always the intention of net metering. Net metering is not really a mission. We've got 2,684 net metering customers in the state, which amount for 0.024%, uh, right? So, so it's tiny. Of Michigan's current retail sales, the program is capped at 0.5%, right? So to say that net metering is, you know, in any material way harming the utilities in Michigan, uh, I don't think so. But they're looking to the future, not the present. Solar's growing very fast. Um, so they haven't determined what this new distributed generation tariff is yet. The, the amounts, the methodology is, is solidified, they haven't determined the amounts. But in the meantime, if you install a uh, solar system on your house uh, before these new rates are approved, which will probably be early in 2019, you will get grandfathered into net metering for 10 years. And then after 10 years, you'll get whatever the new deal is. This is really important. Um, in Nevada, they, they repealed net metering and they made it retroactive. So you just bought your solar system based on the economics of net metering, and then a year later they say, no, you don't get that anymore. Now that law was then overturned. <laughs> All right? Um, to me, I understand you know, net metering is not really a square deal, arguably, for the utilities, although I could argue the other side of that, um, at very little penetrations. Certainly when you've got a significant amount of solar going on, you just can't go on that way. Um, but you don't want to screw the people who were the early adopters. That's not fair either. The distributed generation policy, small up to 20 kilowatt solar users will be credited for power fed into the grid, they call that outflow, at a different and probably lower rate than they pay for power, which is their inflow. Now, there's still a lot of negotiation in this, and one of the key things was, well, is it a fixed rate or is it time of day rates? Are we going to get a different rate for the power we feed in the grid uh, on a summer day when demand's high, or does it have to be 6 p.m.? Where is that line, or is it a flat rate? And the, the utilities were really pushing back, saying, look, we can't make all these billing system changes to make time of day uh, credits on customers' bills. Having worked in software development with large utility-scale billing systems, I, I can understand that. But it's very important to solve. Because if we had a time of day rate that really reflected when the demand is there for the utility, maybe we wouldn't point our solar panels due south. So we're orienting them due south, which is suboptimal given the demand on the utility grid. And we're doing it because it's a flat rate and we don't care. We're maximizing production during the year. We don't care what hour of the day. So I wrote a letter to the MPSC about that. Um, I'm sure that will change their minds. Yeah. <laughs> Do the, do, uh, smart, do the new smart meters have the ability to do instantaneous uh, that buy and that sell? Instantaneous, I'm told no. Hourly, I'm told yes, but that's with an asterisk because there's different brands of meters depending on the utility you're, you're talking about. Um, but I specifically asked that. 
I talked to the woman in the MPSC who's heading this whole thing, and I asked her, well, because they said, power used directly on site would not be subject to this, right? And I said, well, we used on site over what period of time? Is that instantaneous? Is it hourly? Is it, if it was by the day, that'd be great for solar and terrible for the utilities, right? I mean, right now it's really by the year, right? Because we carry forward a net meter in credit. So do you change that to by the day or by the hour? She said they were looking at hourly and that they were told the meters were capable. Right now in Ohio, it's based on the billing period. So it's still great for solar. Yeah, yeah. some solar. Not guys with great drivers. Um, the tariff will be approved by April 20th, and the utilities will then include this tariff in their rate cases after June, and there's a long process. They're saying sometime in early 2019, those will get approved, and then that's the end of the 10-year grandfather on that metering, right? So, this is a great time to install solar. <laughs> uh, this is a quote from PB Magazine. Plans to change that metering programs in Michigan have solar advocates worried that it will slow rooftop solar industry to a crawl. Uh, most solar observers believe the MPSC will recommend changing the net metering to a flat rate tariff approximately five cents less than the current retail rate. So you sell your power for, you buy your power for 15 cents a kilowatt hour and you sell it for 10 cents. That doesn't sound too awful, but the economics of uh, home scale solar right now are just marginal anyway. So the, this will end people installing it purely for economic reasons, which has never really been our biggest driver, but then we only have 2,600 installations, right? Property taxes on home solar. So from 2003 to 2012, all alternative energy system equipment was exempted from property taxes. And wind systems still are, but when they rewrote this law, they kind of left solar in limbo. It's really unclear. I read some mind-hurting legal opinions on this. Um, is, is a PV system real property or personal property? That's a little bit unclear, but the State Tax Commission guide is supporting that solar is personal property. But the guide is not binding law, it's a recommendation. Um, but it's not clear if it's residential personal property or industrial personal property, and they are taxed somewhat differently. Um, Ann Arbor has started applying property taxes to photovoltaic systems, and depending on your property tax rate and such, that will uh, gobble up 30 to 100 percent of the value of the electric output of your solar system, which is, after all, about to decrease by a third uh, as a result of the rescinding of net metering, right? Uh, so this is kind of a one-two punch on, on home-scale solar. Uh, there is a bill in the Michigan House, uh, 5143, that would reinstate the tax exemption for solar. You can write your congressman about that. Uh, the MSC is also revisiting PURPA. They set the rates uh, that utilities paid for electricity under PURPA 25 years ago and haven't changed them since. That's a little silly, especially because wholesale electric rates have dropped 50% in the last 10 years. Um, there will be standard 20-year contracts for systems up to 2 megawatts. Larger ones, uh, the contracts are more negotiable. Uh, they actually have completed the consumer's energy rate case for this. There's a number if you want to look it up. Um, but what the um, company that built the system gets is uh, complicated. There's a per kilowatt hour energy price, and then there's a monthly capacity payment. And one expert said that on a solar system, that would amount to about nine and a half cents per kilowatt hour. If that's true, I'm predicting a plethora of solar systems between uh, one and two megawatts are going to be built in Michigan uh, while that holds. Uh, we'll see. So I, I, I'm taking one expert's opinion on how you convert that capacity charge into cents per kilowatt hour, but uh, we'll see. Cause you remember when we had the, the Lazarus chart there of localized cost, right? Uh, solar was considerably less than nine and a half cents kilowatt. So, all right. I'm just a little bit late. Um, CO2 emissions are continuing to climb. The planet's getting warmer. The U.S. needs to cut 90%. That's if we allocate CO2 emissions on a per capita basis. Yes? So, in regard to that 90%, you're still utilizing large power plants and say burning cleaner natural gas, but you're still producing carbon. That's not going to get you to 90%. Right. Not even close. 
Uh, natural gas power plant produces about half the CO2 per kilowatt hour of a coal-powered power plant, and that doesn't get you even close to the 90%. Mm -hmm. It's a step in the right direction, but then that natural gas plant's going to be run for a long time, right? Solar and wind provide about 6% of the world's electricity, and installations are accelerating based on economics, with renewable energy taking the, over the grid so quickly there is hope if subsidies are allowed to phase out gradually and new barriers are not erected. Federal tariffs on imported PVs will slow home scale and especially utility scale solar uh, for however long they last. Um, if that HR bill passes and guts PERPA, that would uh, greatly limit um, uh, the large scale installations to utility owned systems that still get built. Right? It won't be a third party building it and selling it to the utility, the utilities will buy them, which might be a little slower than otherwise. Hard to say for sure. Um, Michigan small scale solar economics are good, but they're about to change. Between the DD tariff and the application of property taxes, it's going to kill the economics. It's not to say nobody will install solar. People were installing solar when it was outrageously expensive, um, but it's not going to be good for the economics. The PERPA review could be, and it's a little unclear at this point, a big stimulus for mid scale solar installations. Right? Not as big as that one in the pier, that's 50 megawatts, but not the small thing you see in somebody's backyard either. That's everything I've got. I will stay here and answer questions as long as anybody wants. Uh, but the, the, you know, there is food calls. <laughs> um, and again, if you want a copy of the slides, send me an email. I'll shoot them to you. We're going to post them on the website.